not any pedagogical practice or any mathematical axis. This is about the justice of praxis. This is about navigating the arts and community into the classroom, so let's map this. This is about how the voices of students and educators and community and activists and academe weave and assert themselves into the narrative tapestry of humanity. This is about honoring leg legacies of struggle and justice and how they come to bear on this particular historical moment. Here and now, within this temporal space, this is about your choice to participate in the shaping of our collective reality through your presence and engagement of work that understands education as a site that is fraught with potential for negotiating all types of freedom. Today, as a partner of this Urban Word NYC initiative, the Institute for Urban and Minority Education invites you to the Preemptive Education Conference. As UMI seeks to bring the material reality of our urban communities into our conceptions of pedagogical possibility and demand space for the voices and wealth of urban youth within and beyond the classroom, we stand with the aims of this preemptive education conference effort. Emerging out of a community-based teacher training, the preemptive education conference centers the voices of young people, honors community and academy-based efforts, and provides hands-on rigorous professional development through the lens of critical literacy, hip hop, and spoken word. Welcome to day one of the preemptive education conference, the inaugural Maxine Green Lecture Series. And now, please join me in a warm welcome of the Urban Word NYC director, Michael Sorelli. Good evening, how y'all doing? Good. Thank you, Jamila. Um, I always have to tell people that Jamila is an incredible example of the model of Urban Word, which is to provide spaces for young people to grow and become leaders in their communities. Jamila actually was a student in our program since she was 15 years old. She went to college, she also went and got her master's degree at Hunter College, came back to Urban Word and was a full-time staff member there running numerous programs and just last year started here at Teachers College in her PhD program for which she's a second year student right now. So She, uh, she basically co-directs this conference um, with me every year now, so it's an incredible honor to have her working in service of, of the work that we do um, in this capacity, especially here at Teachers College. So thank you for being here. This conference grows every year, so in order to, to meet that growth, in, in order to innovate the work that we do, um, I just want to tell you really briefly about the conference itself and how we came about with the idea of the Maxine Green Lecture. Um, traditionally, the conference is a three-day conference. It starts off and kicks off on a Friday night, which is actually going to be tomorrow night at the Silver uh, at the Kimmel Center, where we take three young poets and pair their work with three scholars in a way that not only validates their work but champions their work. So it's an incredible twist and spin on the traditional panel discussion. On the Saturday of the conference, which is also at NYU Silver Center, it's a day-long event filled with workshops for teachers, educators, and community activists. It's, it's a professional development day for teachers because we feel like if, if all of our work in the community is about creating spaces for young people to grow and develop themselves, we need to have spaces for our teachers to also replenish themselves in their practice. So that's what Saturday is about. And um, on Sunday, we have a youth day, and that's a day that we can model the work where teachers and young people come together to actually take writing workshops, hip-hop workshops, spoken word. That's going to be at an incredible community center called El Puente in Brooklyn. So I urge you all to get a flyer on the way out. If you haven't registered for this weekend, come through and, and really just um, have an incredible time building with all these phenomenal educators. 
So that brings me to the Maxine Green Lecture. We needed to grow this conference. We needed to have um, more opportunities to center the work that we're doing. So when we were thinking about the types of things and people that we want to honor, the types of legacies and thinkings that we want to honor, we came upon the idea of having a Maxine Green Lecture Series. The idea of the lecture series is really to um, praise and commend people that have the values and that are pushing the work that Maxine has pushed her entire career. So ultimately tonight what you're going to see is you're going to see a lecture by a scholar, an academic, and then we're pairing that scholar and academic with a community organizational leader. So when I went to Maxine's house to get her blessing for this lecture series, we didn't go in there thinking that she was going to be the actual lecturer. We wanted to honor her and the legacy that she has brought up for us, but she immediately said, I would love to give the first lecture. So we're honored and grateful for Maxine to be the first um, lecturer of the inaugural Maxine Green Lecture Series. And you will get to see her speak with an incredible organizational leader from the Global Action Project, the, the former executive director of the Global Action Project, Megan McDermott. So that's the format of tonight. But to get this thing started the way we always do at Urban Word, we need to open the space with some poetry. So we're going to share two poems before we get started. The first poet you're going to see tonight is Ramya Ramana. She's a poet, aspiring activist, and believer of God. She is a member of the Urban Word, NYC Youth Board, and digital media team. Ramya recently won the New York Knicks Reason I Write Scholarship to St. John's University, where she is currently studying philosophy and government and politics. Give it up for Ramya Ruan. lullabies anymore. I don't believe in the sun shine anymore. These sirens sound like shower doors nowadays. Sound like religious ritual nowadays. Sound like routine nowadays. These sirens have become my bedtime stories, but these stories have taught me a lot more than black boy corpses. They have taught me that America has a problem with short-term memory loss. I guess that's just why history keeps repeating itself. I must admit, I come from a rich white neighborhood in Long Island that knows nothing sacred about project buildings except that it is black people's fault that they are in there in the first place. They don't have the time to observe the structure and realize it looks like a sideways slave ship. They don't know about Jim Crow laws or Malcolm X. All they know is that they're afraid of these guns and this violence and these guns and this violence and these guns. This gun has become intimate with a dialect of white man palms, have grown fond of those who make hunchback giraffe out of dark bone silhouettes. They will say to you that they will speak in tongues coded in leech alphabets and say that the bridge between your lungs still has the number I gave you written in smoke on it, that the trees we planted still dance to the braille of your necks, that my belt still takes at the cracks of your spinal cords. They will say that we will know nothing of your gods or what it means to be drenched in the rain coming from broken clouds or how it feels to think that the sky is an angry elephant playing tug of war with your children. They won't understand the stories in the Bible that they will claim to teach you when they use your temple against you, say to them that you are no longer afraid of melanin, that you will no longer be safe on the railroad. You will dare to make highways struck out of your footwork. And I will say to all the rich white people in my town who used to make black jokes in class in confidence because they knew no harm could be done to them, that what you sow is what you reap. And Jesus was not a conservative, but a socialist. So make pedestal out of your souls. And when they mock you in closet rhythm, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and all the spirits hanging from the trees that their ancestors made lynch out of when they say to you that black people are too loud too violent and too angry, say to them that this is what happens when you silence royalty. Thank you. Thank you, Rania. The 
next poet I'd like to introduce is Khadija Johnson. She is a spoken word artist who dedicates her writing towards the development of emotional preparation. She believes artistic release can help one brace themselves and build one's character before any emotionally traumatic situation. She has been part of the Urban Ward Youth Board family for two years and currently attends Brooklyn College as a biology major and a creative writing minor in hopes of integrating science in her emotional con concoctions as well as mentor other students about the importance of balancing emotional and physical health through creative release. Give it up for Khadija Johnson. The church next door to the liquor store, next door to the projects. There's a crying girl next door to the church, next door to the liquor store, next door to the projects. There's a crying girl covered in drapes next door to the church, next door to the liquor store, next door to the projects. There's a crying girl covered in drapes, dripped in the blood of her wounded heart next door to the church, next door to the liquor store, next door to the church, next door to the projects. There's a crying girl covered in drapes, dripped in the blood of her wounded heart, standing above a broken Hennessy bottle next door to the church, next door to the liquor store, next door to the church, next door to the projects. There's a crying girl covered in drapes, dripped in the blood of her wounded heart, standing above her dying baby beside a broken Hennessy bottle next door to the church, next door to the liquor store, next door to the church, next door to the projects. When you stroll down Flatbush Avenue around 9, 10 o'clock at night with a loved one, you feel a force field around you. All of the chaos circles around your head like halos on angels standing next door to the projects. I was not expecting to see something to alter my sense of peace and happiness. I lose his eye contact, I'm placed into peripheral vision. The brightness in my pupils started to dim and he paused and asked me, what's wrong? I said, oh, nothing because I know I'll be walking for an hour, and I didn't want that lodged in my memory the whole walk home. The mother's breast milk is too contaminated with eviction notices, spiteful church prayers, and crossed eyes. I focus on the scene across the street, trying to keep my footsteps in sync with his. Even from afar, her aura seems more shattered than the bottle. I kept my eyes there for 15 seconds, and each second I was further convinced the cracked bottle will help her become more emotional. If you're in the presence long enough, it'll be a part of you. There is no happiness next door to the projects, next door to the church, next door to the liquor store, next door to the Hennessy bottle by the dying baby, under the crying woman wrapped in the drapes, drenched in the blood of her wounded heart, next door to the church, next door to the projects. Khadija wrote that poem after Sekou Sandiata, the late Sekou Sandiata, which we did a performance uh, in his honor uh, last month, so thanks for that. And so now the moment you've all been waiting for, the inaugural Maxine Green Lecture. Um, before I read her bio, which I had to abridge because it, it goes for pages, because she's done so many incredible things in her life, I want to just um, acknowledge that seven years ago when we moved into our new space on 27th Street, it was Maxine that brought us into that space. She hosted uh, a book, a book drive, a book donation drive. So everybody that came to celebrate us moving into our first space as an organization before that we were uh, an umbrella, umbrella by a larger organization. Everybody came and gave us a book, and those books still line the walls of our office to this day. So we're grateful for that. So Maxine Green is a professor emerit. Emeritus of Philosophy and Education at Teachers College, Columbia University. She is the past president of the Philosophy of Education Society, the American Educational Studies Association, and the American Educational Research Association. Also a member of the National Academy of Education and the recipient of nine honorary degrees. She has authored six books, among them, The Dialectic of Freedom, Releasing the Imagination, and Variations on a Blue Guitar. She was awarded the Medal of Honor from Teachers College and Barnard College, Educator of the Year Award from Phi Delta Kappa, the Scholarly Achievement Award from Barnard College, AERA's Lifetime Achievement Award, 
and received a Fulbright Fellowship, which took her to New Zealand. She founded the Maxine Green Foundation for Social Imagination, the Arts, and Education at Teachers College in 2003. Most recently, she was a founding member and is current president of the Maxine Green Center for Aesthetic Education and Social Imagination. Dr. Green's dedication to aesthetic education stands in large part to her 25 plus years association with the Lincoln Center Institute, where she was formerly the philosopher in residence. It is a great honor to have her kick this thing off that we will do um, moving forward from this day forth in, in, in the honor of the work that she's done. Please welcome Dr. Maxine Green. imagine uh, the honor that I feel. Uh, it's very hard to, uh, it's very hard to realize that you think of me in terms of words, in terms of language, in terms of critical literacy. I must, I must say with some embarrassment that I still don't know what preemptive means. <laughs> I, I keep asking people, but nobody's sure. <laughs> so, so that, uh, but I, I, I accept this anyway. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And I want to say that without Holly Fairbank, uh, I couldn't have finished the speech. I couldn't have dared to be here, not knowing the, what preemptive means. I don't think you know either. <laughs> But we're trying. So I'll talk a little bit, <clears throat> and uh, I hope I make some sense. I seem to have left my voice somewhere, so I'm sorry if it sounds very peculiar. Uh, but it's very important for all of us to hear your voices and to, and to get some notion of what is truth. The way you use words and phrases, rhythm, an emphasis on your words and how you have chosen to shape them in creating your own meanings. In, in, in choosing them, you have found the truth of who you are and how you perceive your world and what your voice sounds like in the fog that surrounds us all. You have listened to your own lived world your own unique frequencies. And in doing so, you've helped us hear ours. And that's something very wonderful and something that we're all grateful for. Your inner feelings, frequencies, and hopes, your descriptive experiences are more relevant than ever to those who live in the world differently than you do. <laughs> Sorry. Poetry gives us the capacity to feel and empathize. It gives us the capacity to identify with others, to, to identify even with strangers. The uh, poetry gives us the capacity to feel and empathize, identify with others, as I said, in new but familiar voices. We are not left alone, and, and we do not know, remain, we do not remain aloof and untouched. Poetry can do that. Poetry can overcome that aloofness, that apathy. Poetry gives us an agency to make changes in the world, not to sit in passivity and wait for the world to move with agency, with a sense of our own power. We have the power, the energy, the belief.
belief to access change once, once, once you express yourselves, as you know, you discuss the power, you discover the power you never thought you could have. <clears throat> Something happens when you listen to another's perspective, to another person's words. They move you to rethink your own way of seeing and imagining. I'm so sorry about my voice. <clears throat> <laughs> once you once you express yourself, oh no, I'm reminded of the poet Philip Lee Levine, who started out in Detroit in the automobile factories, uh, who, and he became hooked. He said on the poet John Keats on coming in into New York. He wrote about his life in the, in the city, his urban world of the 90s. This, this is a moment he wrote in the daily life of the world, a moment that will pass into, excuse me, at least I don't have to say preempt. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go back so I won't have to. I'll stop. I just want to go back a minute about Philip Levine, who started out in Detroit in a working class family working in the automobile factory. And when he became hooked, he said, on the poet John, uh, John Keats. That's such a <coughs> wonderful word. What a wonderful thing to think about. An automobile worker, re worker reading John Keats. Uh, and it should, it should be an inspiration to so many of us. Is this where I am? Yeah. You know yourselves that once you express yourselves. Oh? Um, yeah, she reminds me I have to go from there. She's talking about. Uh, the Philip Levine's life when he became hooked on John Keats and came to New York and he wrote about his life in the city, his urban world. This is a moment in the daily life of the world, a moment that will pass into, excuse me, a moment that will pass into the unwritten biography of your city or my city, unless it is frozen into the fine print of our eyes. Reading and hearing your poetry, your poetry, I have an aesthetic response, a really a response that, that consumes all of, all of me. And I don't have to ask if that means you're going to publish in the best magazines. But whether you do or not, and no matter how long you have to wait, uh, you are going to arouse aesthetic responses in many people. I see and hear in the new ways that I haven't thought possible, partly because of you. I attend to my world through the possibilities you bring forth. I can't imitate you, but I'm very moved by what you've given me. The urban world has opened <coughs> to possibilities, a space for your poems to occur. The idea of space is so important, and you help to open it for yourself and for others. The phrase urban word invites us to attend to the sick urban experiences, the experiences we all have at the cities by means of poetic language, a language that uses metaphor, uses words that go on beyond the purely logical, the didactic word not only describes or evolves or suggests, it opens us to the world in different ways. It affirms these diverse moments of truth. 
and that's world. Thank you very much. myself um, as I've grown as someone working in the, the not-for-profit youth development field. She's just somebody that I always lean on whenever I need advice or a space to gripe really because it's a, it's a hard field and I'm honored that she's here for this first inaugural lecture. Um, her name is Megan McDermott. For nearly 20 years, Megan McDermott has been a key supporter of young people's positive development through media, technology, and the arts. After her tenure as a researcher with the EDC Center for Children and Technology, Megan directed Global Action Project, an award-winning youth media arts organization from 2003 to 2013, leading implementation of its social justice mission and strengthening GAP's position as a national leader in the field of youth media. She has served as an advisor for the Youth Media Learning Network, the Youth Media Reporter, as well as NISCA, the Smithsonian, and the NEA. She was a co-founding member of the Urban Visionaries Youth Film Festival and the NYC Critical Literacy Study Group. While Megan received her master's in education from Harvard, has continued to develop her leadership through participation in a range of progressive institutes, and most recently completed the Coral Leadership Fellowship. Her inspiration for the political possibilities of art come from Maxine Green and the power of social imagination. Currently, Megan is an independent consultant who passionately supports arts and social justice organizations as they develop the capacity they need to make actionable change. Please give it up for Megan McDermott. Or when you're in a panel that's being run by young people, or when you're 
or walking down a block next to a church, a liquor store, a project. What happens for you in building a world that you want to be otherwise, right? What does that look like when we do it together? So this is my, this is my moment of Maxine. So I'm born and raised in New York, and I've had the great privilege of being in this space when Maxine was teaching um, just as a kid because my dad used to be in the building. So I, I feel terribly spoiled about being mm -hmm. able to be next to you right now. But being born and raised in New York, I had never gone to the movie night. I kind of resented it. It was big. It was cold. It kind of looked like a toilet bowl. <laughs> <laughs> so starting this, being part of this organization, a woman named Jen Weiss, who some of you may know, who was part of um, part of the board community, and I, Jen convinced her, said, you've got to take a class with Max. So we're in Maxine's living room talking about the possibilities of aesthetics. What happens when you reflect? What happens when you take a risk, when you open yourself up to an aesthetic moment? I'm guarded. I don't know about all this. I don't know what this is. So she asks us to go to the Guggenheim and just walk. My first time ever, I go. I go in and I walk. And I get angry. And I get full of rage. I feel disassociated from what I'm looking at. I don't know what they're saying to me with that splatter. I don't know what I'm supposed to feel. I just feel like there's this conversation I can't be part of. And then I leave with a sense of deep class fury. That fury opened up an aesthetic possibility for me that I didn't know could be otherwise. Because of those aesthetic transformative moments, they can be beautiful in the way that Maxine described tonight already through poetry and our empathy and what it arouses. And then there are those moments of justice, Gina was saying, and when those aesthetic moments aren't just about framing this, but saying, what has to be different? So in my rage, I left and said, well, what's my role? Well, my role, I'm not an artist, but I'm going to be sure to create space in which young people who have a vision of possibility will do their best work. And that was my aesthetic response that was transformative to a moment of anger because of the good time only made possible because of Maxine's invitation. So again, when we think about preemptive and we think about Maxine and the relationship to what connects us, think about what moves you in your moment, whether it's for better or for worse, don't shut it down. Stay with it and use it as a way to risk and reflect and think about what role you will play through the conference and beyond that's going to keep building aesthetic, political, social justice. Time some immigrants have in, in, in the city because they're not looked on, looked at, or treated as if they were human like everybody else. It's the alienation of people that frightens me. And I think very often about the need to have the hold hands, mm -hmm. to hold hands with the stranger. So I'm just holding on to that, the idea of holding hands with a stranger. 
and the risk that that asks of us and what is transformative about taking that risk. So just recently, thinking about that, I passed, um, maybe some of you have seen this, it's a piece of street art. It's two posters, one hand and one hand. And it asks of you to stop and stand and wait for a stranger to come and put your hand on the other and begin a conversation. But I haven't dared to do it yet. But now that you said that, I'm going to go stand with my hand on the wall and see what happens. <laughs> you do it too? <laughs> so the other thing I wanted to ask you about was language, where you started. You were talking about words. And what the word, um, what transformative means to you and how you'd like people to think about that in their daily practice as they meet strangers, as they think about their role. I think, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when I think about transformation, I think about moving from a kind of lonely spot where, that, where I don't hear the words of others, where, where I don't connect. And so that what concerns me is reaching the hand out and feeling what we have in common and what separates us. And we need to understand all of that. I look around and I see friends of mine. I also see people I don't know. And I want to say, look me up at the telephone book. We could have tea and crumpets sometime. <laughs> but it's so, I want so much to reach across the distances that create strangers. And there will always be strangers, but at the same time, we have to keep holding hands. I'm sorry for my voice. <laughs> no, it's fine. We can hear you. So part of the challenge, right, to building that is also thinking about the role of power in our relationships. And what do we do when we want to actually change through our words, through our dance, through our visual images, that sense of what could be? Yes. Imagination. <coughs> Imagination has to do with possibility. What, what might be, what, uh, we never settle for what is. We look for the, the possibility, we look for change, uh, and you, ra <coughs> you raise the idea of power. What do we do about power as it exists in our community? We have to use our own energy, our own inner power. We have to come together to name the alienation in this, to, to name the unhappiness, to name the poverty, to name the, uh, what happens when you've never read a poem, when you've never read a novel, when you've never heard a dance. How can we fill those holes? And I think that's part of our job. As both educators and creators. Right. So I've gotten the privilege to ask Maxine some questions. I think Michael is now for time. Okay, so for folks, for all of you, please feel free to ask questions. And Holly's going to help if Maxine can't hear. She may repeat the question. But here's your opportunity to also ask what, you know, what you're thinking about, what you're wrestling with, what you want to share. Thank you. And don't be shy. I won't be. <laughs> <laughs> with what I call the farm before. 
before. So were folks able to hear what Maxine was, her first response was, you're going to fight? Okay, so that's part of the reality, yeah. Thank you. She's my doctor. <laughs> Identify human beings who are different, but who are full of possibility. How can art help with that, with that stepping into the possibilities with these people who maybe are not comfortable in this space? Thank you. <laughs> As Sally knows, uh, I think both of us uh, and many of you put great confidence in the art experience in being connected with it. And what our job, partly, as teachers is to, is to create a space in our classrooms where people can come together with some notion of beauty, of courage, of, of, uh, of understanding. Create a space where art can live and which helps us to come along. Um, I've been asking a lot of people what is uh, their definition of inspiration because I've recently was told by someone that heard someone say if they had to wait for inspiration, they'd be dead. So, so, so what is your definition of inspiration? Definition of inspiration. Oh. <laughs> First of all, it, 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 in what you said that you have to wait for inspiration, I think you probably do. You can't go and say, today I'm going to be inspired. <laughs> inspiration, as far as I'm, as I'm concerned, comes with a sudden awareness, a sudden recognition it's like when you see a flower in the park, and it's suddenly so beautiful and so un, uh, so uh, so uh, what, what do I want to say? So suggestive in so many ways that that gives me inspiration. Inspiration, uh, you, you, as you know, comes from the idea of inspiring with some kind of some kind of, uh, I was thinking of Buddha for some reason, some kind of uh, uh, breath, a new breath coming through you, when you suddenly say, oh my God, I saw that. All of a sudden I heard that, that I've lived all these years and I never noticed the look of little children falling asleep in, in audiences. <laughs> 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 I never realized how important it is to forgive them, to feel a connection with them. But there's so many ways in which uh, inspiration, a child's face, I know, 
I know how uh, foolish it sounds, but a child's face, a child's hair ribbon, a child's way of looking at me and letting me look at her uh, are part of what's involved in inspiration. I don't have to go to the Guggenheim. I do go to the Guggenheim to have another kind of excitement, to see things I never thought I'd see. But there's something very special about seeing other human beings and connecting with them. It's better than the good in time in some way. But, but if we've had that experience with the children and with other people, the good in time can come alive as it couldn't have before. Thank you. I just started at Teachers College this past semester, so I've been thinking about my experience here so far. Like your idea of imagination and thinking about what could be otherwise is really like one thing I've been thinking about a lot as well, because I've been thinking about how can I think about schools being otherwise mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how that's related to my experience learning here. And I'm thinking, um, how, how, can my, how can I as a student make sure my experience here is one where I'm like imagining what is otherwise because I'm having a hard time I think sometimes. Um, there's a lot of people, you know, we have 32 credits to fulfill and we have to get those done and I have required classes and I have books to read but really like, I think what we need to be doing at Teachers College is exactly what you're saying is doing this imaginative process and maybe we should be doing this. We should be writing poetry daily or something like that. Um, I'm wondering what you think about Teachers College as a place to encourage people to imagine to think otherwise. Oh, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> I'm very glad you said that, and I'm glad uh, that you said it with a tone of voice that you'd say, let's burn the house down. <laughs> <laughs> you said this is possible, but we all, we all know that there are moments, there are moments in my life where I'd like to say burn the hands down. <laughs> that we've tried and we've done this and that. So we have to get together and decide on modes of imagination, modes of protest, which allows the house to stand, but makes all kinds of unimaginable changes, un un unimaginable uh, openings, or, or finding doors, finding doorways to hope that we never knew existed. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Green, thank you so much. You are absolutely a living legend, and it's such an honor to be here tonight. It's a moment I know none of us will forget. One of the really amazing things I think about the arts, arts plural, is their ability to forge and build relationships across significant difference. People who might not normally become friends do so, become friends, become collaborators because of, because of the arts, because of, a, because of poetry, music, plays, paintings, whatever. And I was just wondering if you could speak to why it is, uh, just to just speak to a little bit about what it is about the arts that, ha that, that makes the arts be able to build relationships uh, between people that think of themselves as very different. What is it about the arts that can get us past uh, the differences that, that keep us separated? Uh, because I think that's one of the things that's so exciting about the arts is, is it can build relationships that previously were thought to be impossible and therefore collaborations um, become possible because of the arts to challenge, to, you know, to engage the challenges of, of our day. But what is it about the arts that, that helps to build these relationships across difference? That's what I thought, and, and the, you, I was very interested 
and you're talking about relationship and connection with the arts, uh, because the most fascinating experiences I've had uh, have come when, I, when I've taken uh, students or gone with people to the museum and asked them, what did they see? What did they see in that Picasso? What did they see in the Cezanne? And they see different things and they interpret differently. And it's the moment of, of, of when, they, when they have an interpretation that's theirs and they hear a different one and they come together. Those are the moments that I appreciate. I certainly don't want people to see the same thing. I mean, I don't care if it's the Gernika or some other uh, great painting. Um, I don't want them to see exactly what I see. Each person has to see through his own eyes and his own uh, dispositions. And one of the wonderful things for me about the arts that they open to so many possibilities. They open so many doorways. There's no single interpretation of the Ganyka or of, a, of a, a, another kind of great art. There's no way of saying, this is what it means in sitting down. You can never say that. There are all kinds of possibilities. <laughs> I just, I hate fixed answers. I forget, I hate uh, when, when we have the questions answered and fixed. The reason I like the idea of ambiguity is because there's uncertainty, uncertainty and wonder, perhaps wonder. Those are words that move me. Anything but fixity, anything but solidity, I, I'll accept. But there, <clears throat> there are people who are afraid of, of questions. They want the answers. I want the unanswered question. And I'm just going to say, that makes me think of how John Dewey was very clear about the notion of models. Yeah. That models should not exist. All we have is our opportunities to experiment and build together. Right. And that our learning happens in those social spaces. And as soon as someone thinks they have a model, exactly. or they have that answer, you need to run. That's you right. need to create that other space in which to experiment and be. But I'm also going to add a little wrinkle and say, it's not just the arts as a thing that allows for those relationships to built, it's what as practitioners, as activists, as young people, as justice makers, we want to do with the form. Good. Because I do think that the arts in and of themselves, like, could be anything, right? So it can reproduce power in ways that, that hold us back, or it can be a representational moment, we can explode. But it's not the arts, it's what we are intentional, deliberative about, and then willing to risk on. And I think that's where we start to then do the community building that brings people in to those spaces and says, this is a place where you're going to have to work to build trust to create the purpose of whatever vision we make. And that's not easy to do. So I think um, we've got one more. Is there time? OK, last question. Um, We've come from Wales on a sort of fact-finding mission, so it's a privilege to go straight to the horse's mouth, not that I'm calling you a horse at all. <laughs> but we, we'd like to ask you now, we're looking forward to the whole conference, but if we can get the definitive answer in terms of what is the essential thing you, need, you think that we as educators of poetry need to get out, need to achieve with young people? What's the essence of that engagement between us, them, and the word? 
I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Organization or the, 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 the words themselves. The word, what, what is it? What? So, so what is the essence that we need to take back as educators about using, in this case, poetry as the as the form that we want young people to experience? Yeah. I think you talked about it before. But yeah. Just to recap. But it's so. Uh, most people, I think, most parents. <laughs> Uh, are afraid of, of uh, poetry, are afraid of, like the father who wants the son to go in business. Mm -hmm. God forbid, <laughs> spends, his, spends his time reading poetry on the subway. And so we have to, we have to talk to people who, have, who are insensitive uh, to what opens up for you when we face all these unanswerable questions and when we reach each other in relationships, many of the hardened people have, have no idea. And, and just to add to that, I, you know, I think it's also what you already do as poets. You love the word. You love the words we, the relationship to the world, to shifting the world. And that reframing, that possibility of sharing that, not necessarily as like, this is how it's done, but your love, of that, I think that's also part of this question of what's inspiring, and maybe that's there and lies that connect. Mm -hmm. I was thinking too of what you said before about finding the frequencies in themselves. Mm -hmm. and how a teacher brings that forward. Yeah, I'm very interested, in, and I'm sure you are. When I'm in a classroom, I want I, I want to connect with the young people in the class. I do not want to impose upon them some of my wonderful ideas. <laughs> I, 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 want, I want to wait and see if at some point in the class there's a kind of electrical current that connects, that connects me and the student in the class without my attempting to impose and without his attempting to crawl and look at me of a smart kid. So on, on that powerful note, we're going to end the conversation with Maxine. And just thank you, all of you, so much for being here to be part of the dialogue with Maxine. And Maxine, thank you. Thank you, thank you Maxine. National Youth Poetry Slam champion. Gabriel Dedek. <laughs> Gabriel's dedication to the organization Urban World landed him a spot on its 2012 Teen Poetry Slam team, the youth board, and the cast of Black Ink with New York Live Arts. Joining him is Zipporah Gatlin, a 19-year-old singer, actor, dancer, poet, and visual artist. She graduated from Repertory Company High School in 2012 and was on the Apollo stage for the New York City Teen Poetry Slam in 2013. She's excited for every opportunity she gets to perform and thanks God every day for her talents. Give it up for Gabe and support. Thank you so much. Women question your kindness, forgive her flesh, for it is young and she lives her life an old, broken woman with cats. Her wedding band bought back from her husband's hooker and a dead mime trying to lasso her to the grave. When women question your kindness, understand, 
magician men have made a disappearing act of her smile and rather took her virginity out of her. All she wanted was to be the card that made people question the air they breathe. He called her magic. She still can't believe it when women question your kindness. It is because you look like the boy who raped her daughter. You smell like a fit husband who raped her daughter. It's nothing personal. When women question your kindness, make her feel worthy of her own skin again. When women question your kindness, give her a reason to straighten her question mark spine into an exclamation point. Remind her that mirrors are just there to show, not to explain. Replace her eyes with moon craters so she will understand the depth of her own beauty and that you love her so much. You will make her a bowl of cereal every morning from scratch. When women question your kindness, demonstrate what a man is without using your penis. Breathe in all of her hell. Melt the masculinity. This will not make you a woman. This will make you understand. Don't become a mess. That be a turn off. And she's been cleaning all of her life. When women question your kindness, check her pulse. Kiss the maggots to make a host of her into butterflies. Tell her how great she makes you feel. How cocoon you will be without her. And how caterpillar you are willing to go. You know, sometimes slow is better for when the journey is finally traveled. The two of you will be able to stop and not exist together with women. Question my kindness. I ask, who was the axe? And what is it like being a tree stump? And what color was the sap? I'm a sap for tree stumps, for broken women, for young flesh, for what is new and has rotting to do. And I am the type of magician that can make rotting seem just like Urban. 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 Urban.